This is Captain's Log with your host, Captain Mark Gray. Welcome aboard. Perhaps the number one cause of injury, accidents, and even death can be attributed to weather. We'll explore this and more from a boater's point of view next. My guest is Max Edelstein. He's a meteorologist from Santa Barbara, California. How are you doing, Max? Very fine. Thank you, Mark. Could you give us a history, a brief history of perhaps your boating meteorology experience? Well, it have to be brief because it goes back so many years, but uh, <laughs> I got started in meteorology uh, around the World War II circa and had active duty in the Navy as a weather officer, and, and I was uh, in government employee. Uh, for the National Weather Service, for the Department of Air Force and the Air Weather Service, and the Navy Department and the Naval Weather Service. And uh, when I retired from the government, I moved to Santa Barbara and went to work for a local weather firm. And at that time, I got actively interested in boating and joined the Power Squadron, United States Power Squadron. And I've been very active in the Power Squadron, primarily in the weather sense. And I've worked my way up through the various ranks in the local, the district, and the national offices. And now I'm chairman of the National Weather Course Committee. And the primary job I'm engaged in right at the moment is completing a new weather textbook to be used for instruction by the United States Power Squadron students. Sounds like quite a, quite a long history and quite an undertaking. Uh, it's, I, lo I love it when people see people they could meet in a hamburger place having a hot dog and say, gee, you know, look at all this that this man has to offer. And by putting it down in text, I think it'll live, outlive both of us, right? Well, Unless the, some whippersnapper revises it somewhere down the road. The text is a sort of curious thing because when you put the weather information you got and try to get it across to boaters so that they can improve boating safety, which is, of course, the thing we're primarily engaged in, there's uh, about a quarter of the people say that this material is too difficult. Another quarter of them say it's sort of trivial and why don't you give us something that's hard? And the rest of them don't say anything. So with that happy median, we feel we're doing the right job. Well, perhaps you could write a, a beginner, medium, and advanced. We did use that technique in the book in requ uh, having a required portion and then having another portion for the PhDs who sit in the back and yawn a little bit occasionally and they can read into the advanced material in the text and that way satisfy everybody. Could you, could you tell us about the weather phenomenon or you know of this area Channel Islands being from the islands out here off Santa Barbara and Ventura and Channel Islands coast? Well I'd, I'd like to start with uh, advising anybody who's going boating out to the Channel Islands which is one of the most treacherous areas along the Pacific coast because of the wide variability of weather to get a good briefing uh, by the National Weather Service. There's the Weather 1 and Weather 2 channels on the national broadcast, the marine broadcast. On your VHF radio VHF for our non-boating friends. It's a radio on the boats. Um, I have noticed something about that forecast, and I do listen to it. But uh, it'll be 11, 12 o'clock in the day. I'll turn it on, and it'll say winds are 5 knots, and it'll be gusting 45 you know, out there, blowing 45. Uh, but they tell you that it was updated last at 10 o'clock, and it doesn't really seem to predict, pr predict into the future, as well as perhaps some other sources. The marine uh, radio broadcast for the coast of California, and I think this is a sort of general statement that go around the entire United States, because of the very large areas they cover and the limited time they have to give their forecast, they have to generalize a great deal. So if they say winds 10 to 20 knots, you'll find some places in sheltered areas uh, where the wind could be less than 10 knots, and you'll find places in the exposed areas will be greater than 20. But the main thing I look for is, and I listen to the weather, and I'm sure a lot of boaters do, is to see what we're going to run in at 6 o'clock that day, and it's now 8 o'clock in the morning. And also, I don't believe TV weather does it. For instance, if you're in a skiing area, radio, TV, newspapers do an in-depth ski report. But it would almost appear that the media in boating communities, Florida, California, and what have you, have forgotten that we are a boating community, or they, perhaps they think we're a small segment of the population. 
Well, Mark, I'd agree with don't you. Don't tailor it to the voter. In the sense that uh, tailored weather information is not provided to the public as much as we would like to see it. Uh, for example, the nearest weather station to Santa Barbara would be down the coast of Los Angeles, the next major station. There is no local station. We'd like to have one, but we understand that the budget being what it is, it's hard to put stations in all over. The broadcasts that go out, as I said before, cover a large area. And to tailor a broadcast to the Channel Islands, you have to appreciate the intricate patterns they have in the islands. Such as? Well, the wind, the prevailing wind comes from the west-northwest, and it sweeps down between the Channel Islands, which are islands off the coast of California, about 20 to 30 miles out. And they are fairly high in places, a couple thousand feet. So the wind blows through between the coastal range, which is the mountain range along the California coast, and the uh, fairly high elevations of the islands. It has a sort of a funneling effect. So the wind speeds up when it comes into the water passage that's between the islands and the coastline. People who go out boating encounter this in what's commonly called Windy Lane out in the Santa Barbara Channel. And they usually encounter that after they've gotten about halfway across to their consternation because the winds were fairly light when they started out and they kept getting stronger and stronger as they proceed. And then when they get out to the islands themselves, they're faced with the phenomena of the wind being stronger on the windward side of the islands and the wind being weaker on the leeward side. And uh, this causes a, a lot of problems for people operating sailboats in particular because, they, of course, they always like to have the wind coming from the favorable direction. And consistent. But I, I notice uh, the weather I see here most often is that the morning it's overcast and kind of calm, usually, if I had to name a typical day at this time of year. And then the uh, sun breaks through around noon or 11 o'clock, 12, 1, 2, 3, and the winds pick up. And I've been out going out to the islands myself, and by the in total calm where I'm motoring, and when I get halfway out, you know, the winds pick up. By the time I get to the islands, I'm pulling sail down, you know, and getting into quite heavy winds and seas. But it seems that the weather patterns here are such to where it would be worthwhile, you know, in the boating accidents, the amount of them because of that, would be worthwhile to perhaps someday get a weather station here. But dealing with what we have to deal with, what is a, the best source that you know of for people to find out about this area, what the weather's going to be? Well, uh, locally in Santa Barbara, <clears throat> we have the harbor master who gives a very fine recording broadcast of about 60 seconds. It's a condensation of the material from the National Weather Broadcast, but it's tailored to the Santa Barbara Harbor area, and they'll give you the harbor weather, the water temperature, and things of that. You know what time and channel? Uh, yes, I have that information available. The harbor master is on. Uh, let's see. And that's uh, that's only Santa Barbara. They don't do it. In no, Hawks it's Island, done at other Portland. places at harbors. Our harbor master's phone number happens to be nine six two zero seven eight two, and that's just a local phone call. In the eight hundred five area, and it's a recording what you get. But there's a lot of sources of weather information. Uh, you have the radio and television. But again, as I say, they don't seem to tailor it for the boaters' needs. You know, really highlighting seas and winds and the tides and what have you. Mark, you've been out, I'm sure, at times when you went into from uh, nearly calm conditions to very severe weather conditions with strong winds, and then you went into calm again. And if you try to picture the difficulty of providing you with this weather information by someone who doesn't know where you're going even, mm. and you might change your mind about where you're going to, so if he gave you a forecast, you'd say, well, it's no good. Uh, tailored weather information, unfortunately, has to be purchased, and it's nothing that the National Weather Service can provide because of the variability of the places people go, the times they go there, the different type of craft they're operating, and all of the other things. The key is education of the boater. That's what I was getting to. The next step, you know, is we, we've illustrated to the boater that it's your obligation. It's something that you need to know about, right? And therefore, you need education and training and perhaps a barometer and the different tools on your boat that can help you in that area that you're in. I think the basic thing that a boater needs, particularly those going out for a one-day cruise, is the appreciation of the importance of the visual observations. 
uh, the cloud conditions, the conditions of the sea, uh, the differences in the types of winds you could get, for example, the gusty wind against the steady wind, if, there's, if it's raining, whether it's showery weather or steady weather. Okay. These tie in to a very interesting pattern. And we're going to have a very interesting pattern when we return right after this. <laughs> I think it means feet. Ahoy there, mates. May I give you two a word of advice? Skipper! I spent many years on a deserted island, and one of the important things I learned is don't leave the harbor without knowing the boat or the rules of safe boating. You can learn them, too, by taking the free instruction sailboat course from the squadron, here. The squadron won't leave you stranded. Relaxing on a boat can mean wonderful memories. Ooh, I got one! But you can't make good memories on the water unless you know how to boat safely. To find out where to take a free boating safety course, call the Boat U.S. Foundation at 800-336-BOAT. If I'd taken a course, I'd have some better memories. We're back with Max Edelstein, a uh, meteorologist from Santa Barbara, California. Could you uh, tell us about the educational sources for the boater, as I think we've established the fact that it's the boater's responsibility to become educated when it comes to the weather and predicting the weather and knowing what's happening out there? Well, this uh, was probably covered in previous uh, material you had, but I think the best sources of information are the weather courses that are taught by the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary and the United States Power Squadrons. Uh, these are beams specifically for boaters. You get an introduction to this when you take the uh, basic course open to the public that both of these organizations teach. They have a small amount of weather. For example, the United States Power Squadron course it has a section on fog and on thunderstorms and on the hazards of lightning to the mast and to people in the boat. Uh, for those people who get more active in either organization, there are advanced courses which usually run for several months in order to get a thorough understanding of the subject. And uh, it is those who really apply themselves to this who I think get the most benefit out of it. Of course, they have, uh, for instance, we had a man on, Mike Pizel, that gives private instruction, takes people out on the boat, heavy weather sailing instruction on the boat in the water. And that's advantageous to find out once you're caught in bad weather, what do you do, you know, with the boat, and I'm all, be, all for that. As to the Power Squadron Coast Guard Auxiliary, the normal route, I understand, is to have one class a week, you know, for a period of three years, perhaps, to get a good background. Is there a speeded up uh, process to that? Well, actually, these courses normally last about uh, two to three months at one night a week. Uh, people who belong to these organizations have an option, or in the power squadron in any event, they have an option of what we call challenging the examination. In other words, they can get the textbook, they can study at home, and in this period of two or three weeks, they can take the national test to see whether or not they have really mastered the course like they think they can. We have some people who just get the textbook and never bother taking the courses, just to read the book and understand what's that portion that interests them. For example, if you're uh, troubled by fog more than any other factor, you can read the section on fog and become well versed in that. Although it'd be wise to go into the other areas too. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, if you're troubled by fog, something else will get you. <laughs> you know, so it's <laughs> probably is smart to touch on everything. Are there other educational sources that uh, people can check into? Uh, there are. There, most of them are not beamed at marine weather. They're at general weather courses, and junior colleges, the colleges uh, have these. There are some private organizations that teach mm -hmm. uh, boating weather. Uh, usually so, as a part of a larger course. The Power Squadron, Coast Guard Auxiliary, highlight weather from a boater's standpoint, so that's excellent. Let me ask this, because we only have a couple minutes left. Um, if I'm a boater and I want to be out in the ocean, cruising or whatever, and predict my own weather, what instruments should I have? 
Well, depending on the part of the country, the various instruments have different value. Barometers, for example, in California are not as valuable as they would be on the East Coast, where they have stronger systems. But I think that uh, the visual observations is the thing that I think, really think is the most important. So the training is the most important instrument you can have? Training, the human eyeball, that's mm -hmm. really the best yeah. instrument that you can And got. you heard it here, live, <laughs> on Captain's Log. And we're out of time, and I appreciate your coming, sir. And please, be safe in the ocean. Watch Captain's Log. Hand me the glass. No, 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 the other one. By Jove, look at that river with the island in the middle. See if it's on the chart. But, sir, I can't read a chart. Well, then you should call Boat U.S. Foundation's toll-free hotline, 1-800-336-BOAT, and they'll tell you about free boating courses. But back to the island. You wouldn't have $24 on you, would you? Oh, sir, I'm broke. Too bad. One day that'll be a bargain. We're here with sea tales, true stories that may save your life out there on the ocean. Learn from the experience of others. Mr. Uh, Chief Teal, right, yes. is with us today, and I understand that you have a sea tale, a true story to tell us, but first, could you give us a little background history on yourself? All right, um, I'm You're Chief Teal, mm -hmm. Mike Teal, I work out in Magoo. As you can tell, I'm in the Navy, and for the past 12 to 13 years, I have been an instructor teaching aerospace physiology and water survival training. And for the last 12 years, I've been teaching the American Red Cross water safety training. I've taught this on the East and the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's around. quite an extensive history there. Um, I understand you do have a CTL, a true story for us with a safety message. Could you go into that? Sure. When I was on a Mediterranean cruise, uh, I was working the flight deck, and we picked up some sailors that had been put out to sea in a life raft. When I say put out, the ship they'd gone, they were on had gone down. Mm -hmm. The uh, ones that we received, we picked up from the water. Two of them were dead. The two we picked up then were in the life raft. Later on, we picked up one that was out of the water itself. Mm -hmm. The two in the life raft had died from exposure. The uh, two that were there had the equipment and the means to extend their life, but for some reason didn't do it. Apparently, it wasn't known to them that they could, either due to lack of training or whatever. But they had the water there to drink, and they had means to open the cans to drink it with but they didn't bother to drink it, or for some reason didn't drink it. They had other means there as far as conserving their body core temperature to uh, fight against hypothermia and exposure, but for some reason they didn't use that either. The equipment I'm talking about there is your space blanket or signaling panel you can actually wrap up inside of it. They had other equipment there as well. The ones we picked up out of the life raft actually had uh, fully dressed as far as long pants, uh, heavy sweater, one of them even had on a pair of socks. But when we picked them up, they were dead from exposure. The important thing is to learn as much as you can about anything and everything that you're doing, especially the water. You have to be able to understand the water and make it work to your advantage because it is not forgiving. And you really have to work hard to do this. It's a constant evolution to learn as much as you can. The water that uh, they had there, if they would have drunk the water, they could increase their survival time. Anytime you go down or 
you're stuck out in the uh, ocean on a survival situation, you want to go ahead and drink some of the water, the fresh water I'm talking about now, to increase your survival time. Because anytime you're in an emergency situation, you are in a light case of shock. So you're losing this body perspiration. So you need to go ahead and replace the body fluids. You don't have to drink all the water, but you do have to drink enough to quench your thirst and then save the rest for later on. If you drink all of it, there's always rainwater that you can use. The important thing is if not it rains. To, if it rains, <laughs> if it true. Rains. If you don't have the water, you can usually last about five to six days. Where on food, you can go about 30 days. Mm -hmm. So the important thing there is to get the water that you need. They found that most people are picked up within the first 24 hours. So it's, it's usually a pretty safe thing that you can last that long. And realizing that you're in a light state of shock, you should drink the water, replenish what you've lost there being in shock, and perhaps eat some food. The food if you've got it. Mm -hmm. One thing that's helpful, and that's a small amount of sugar or even honey, it replaces the body fluid that you've lost, and it's also quick energy, and it's enough to keep you going as well. Sugar will replace the body fluids? Such well, it's as, as primarily the sugar is the quick energy mm -hmm. that you might need. So it helps out pretty good. Honey is the best to use. I understand too, since you did mention honey, I w I'd like to say this. It is the number one cause of botulism in infants because the processing you know, system mm -hmm. that they use cannot kill the botulism spores. So uh, I know when I was a child, mothers were pushing honey on the kids. So my preference is not honey. You know, I, I might be more apt to carry sugar or something. Sugar or uh, whatever you, you uh, personally prefer. The important thing is you do need to replace the body fluid. A lot of people will simply take along these small packets of jelly mm -hmm. and that seems to, work, seems to work pretty good as well. So some sort of high energy bars, yes. fruit bars, there are many things that are made to last a long time like mm -hmm. that, right? Uh, even chocolate bars are good. No, they might not keep for months and months <laughs> until your ship goes down. That's true. The important thing too is that if you have food there, you may or you do not want to drink the water if you don't have the water because if you drink, eat the food that makes you thirsty mm -hmm. and oh uh, you mean you don't want to eat the food if you don't have the water that's because, correct right uh, i wonder if you could lie in the water perhaps to reduce uh you know loss of body water you know like say it's a hot day you can lie in the water and hang on to the raft and that might slow down the uh, loss of water in your body it uh, does slow it down to some degree, but it also does a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. On a really hot day, you can get heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And the fastest and easiest way to fight against this is to simply go back into the water. And once you're back in the water, make sure you're still tied to the life mm -hmm. raft. But, so that way you don't drift away from it. But in the water, it does cool you off and uh, it does fight against exposure or uh, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. It so works if, really well. especially if there's more than one person, you know, you have one in the raft to watch the other and tie them also, yes. you know, to the raft and uh, be very cautious about what you're doing. But you can use that as a oh, survival yes. technique. That's true. You well, mentioned uh, mm -hmm. someone else in the life raft. Mm -hmm. If you ever do go down, it's important to stay together and work together as a team because in this concept, you help each other out and if there is an injury, you can help each other and treat each other that way. It's also a good morale booster because they found that when people go down, the biggest problem they face is that they start giving up in their mind before they give up anything else. And once you've given up in the mind, then it usually doesn't last that long. Yeah. Well, I see we're running out of time, but we have about one minute left. Uh, do you have a few quick pointers or safety tips about that being in that type of situation? All right, the important thing on there is to learn as much as you can. Uh, I highly recommend to go through as many classes as you possibly can. Even your basic uh, boating safety courses is a great advantage there. Try and read as many books as you can. One book that's good to read is a book by the name of All the Drowned Sailors. It's of the USS Indianapolis when it was torpedoed and went down. It uh, talks about when the people were in the water, some of the problems they faced as far as dehydration, exposure, any type of injury, uh, fuel and gasoline in the eyes and the throat, and even after they were picked up, some of the problems they had there due to secondary infections and things like this. So it's a very good book, and basically any book you can read. The more information you can get, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. So you might, you want to absorb the information and put it to use, have good safety gear and survival gear. Right. And we're doing a whole show on that. Good. Pretty soon here. Yes. Uh, not only read the books, but actually go out and practice it as well. It's good right. to have.
Well, I do appreciate your being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching Captain's Log. We hope that these little tidbits of information may save a life, perhaps yours or that of a loved one. Thank you.